It is my honor to welcome you all to this fifth award of this incredible award developed five years ago. Many of you may not know this, but in 2020, Ellen Alimony, chairwoman and CEO of the CIT Group, was the awardee. In 2019, Ron Williams, then chairman and CEO of Aetna, received this award. Prior to Ron, Liz Smith in 2018, executive chairwoman and CEO of Blooming Brands, received the award. And our inaugural winner was Mike Lamarche, who was chairman and CEO of Ingersoll Rand. Tonight, Juan Luciano, chairman, president, and CEO of ADM, joins this august group of business leaders. In a few minutes, Pat Wright will introduce our recipient tonight, and he will take over the event. It is purely my job to welcome you all here. We do know that with a bit of luck, we have executives from Eastman Chemical and Medtronic watching online. We estimate there are about 100 students with us here tonight, the majority from the MHR program, but many from the Moore School undergraduate program. Equally, we are joined by a great array of management faculty sitting in front of me here, and of course, our Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, Deborah, sitting over there, Deborah Hazard. I know this is going to be an incredibly educational event for many of our students, and I urge you all to listen carefully and to ask questions when you get the opportunity. It is now my extreme pleasure to introduce the gentleman sitting to the left of me, Pat Wright. Pat is the Thomas C. Van Diver Bicentennial Chair and Founder and the Faculty Director of the Center for Executive Succession. And that is the center which is giving this award. Hi, everybody. I am Pat Wright, and, uh, the Director of the Center for Executive Succession. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, and to welcome you to the fifth annual Leadership Legacy Award Ceremony. The Center for Executive Succession was founded with the mission of being the objective source of knowledge around the issues, challenges, and best practices with regard to C-suite succession, and in particular, CEO succession. By objective, what we mean is that we are a research institute who has nothing to sell. We don't have an agenda. We're um, simply focused on trying to generate knowledge that will help companies be better at C-suite succession. In, in 2016, we created the Leadership Legacy Award and have been, as Pete mentioned, honored to recognize Mike Lamock, who was the CEO of Ingersoll Rand at the time, now uh, chairman at Train Technologies, Liz Smith of Bloom and Brands, Ron Williams of Aetna, and Ellen Alamani, the uh, CEO of CIT Group. And today we're really, really excited and honored to be able to uh, name Juan Luciano, the CEO of Archer Daniels Midland, as the, uh, the latest winner of the Leadership Legacy Award. Now, when we created the Leadership Legacy Award, there were really three purposes that we had behind that. The first was what we wanted to do was to honor CEOs who displayed a personal commitment to building leadership talent in the organization while driving successful financial, social, and organizational performance. It's, only, it's the only award, reward, uh, award of its kind that celebrates a CEO's profound personal commitment to developing C-suite leaders. Now, I emphasize personal commitment because we recognize that in many companies that are on lists like the best companies for leaders, the CEO's role is simply to sign a budget line or maybe say something about the importance of talent on occasion, but they don't really see it as a part of their responsibility as a CEO to be developing the future uh, uh, pipeline of talent. So we want this award to recognize those who are building leadership talent as a critical part of their role as a CEO and at the same time delivering great results for shareholders, customers, and society. Second reason that we began this award is that what we wanted to be able to do was expose our Darlamore stu uh, students to what successful leaders look like. A CEO who has been successful in building leadership talent, 
modeled what it means to be a leader while at the same time creating great organizations. And then the third purpose was, to be quite honest, to expose great leaders to our great students in the hopes that as they see the quality of students that we have here in the Moore School, they will be more interested in partnering with the school and hiring our graduates. Uh, Juan just met with a group of some of our CES uh, research assistants uh, where they got a chance to ask him questions, he got a chance to ask them questions, and I think, um, you know, I'll speak on uh, behalf of the faculty members that were there, I think our students were outstanding at representing the quality of students that come from the Moore School. Let me introduce Juan. So since Juan joined the company 10 years ago, ADM has experienced a remarkable growth with industry-leading ingredients and solutions that are opening the company to growth opportunities in key global macro trend areas. Luciano spearheaded the increased use of innovative technologies and led a strategic growth campaign that expanded ADM's global footprint and transformed ADM into a world leader in human and animal nutrition. At the same time, he led efforts to continue building the organization's internal leadership capacity. And he, I want to point at uh, uh, two things that he did in particular that were really um, what drove us as we were considering the candidates for this award this year that really led us to choose Juan as this year's winner. The first is that Juan has focused on building a cadre of talented women within ADM. He sponsored and participated in a full-day women's summit as part of his effort to increase the representation of women in P&L roles at ADM. Secondly, Juan has helped lead this Together We Grow, which is a consortium of modern food and agriculture companies, NGOs, members of academia, and the government who have un a united focus on building a skilled, diverse, and inclusive workforce to make American agriculture a leader for generations to come. Dedicated to feeding rapidly growing population while using fewer resources, Together We Grow aims to attract the brightest talent to the increasingly high-tech industry of agribusiness. Thus, I'm delighted to recognize Juan Luciano as the winner of the 2021 Center for Executive Succession Leadership Legacy Award. The award comes with a $10,000 gift to the charity of his choice, and uh, we will be finding out what charity that is later on. So with that, thanks and congratulations, Juan. Let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Pat and Peter, and thank you to the entire uh, Center of Executive Succession. I'm honored and humbled to be the fifth recipient of the Center's Legacy Leadership Award, and I accept this on behalf of all my 40,000 fellow colleagues at ADM, some of whom have joined us virtually this evening. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be with you in person, but as we continue to navigate this pandemic, the safety of our employees worldwide has been at the forefront of our efforts, and that includes taking extra precautions related to travel. I hope I will be able to join you again face to face at a later date on a beautiful campus in Colombia. Maybe I will be, it will be helpful to take a step back and explain who ADM is, since we are not necessarily a household name. ADM's purpose is to unlock the power of nature to enrich lives. Our 40,000 colleagues are innovating every day with a focus on this purpose and in the context of three macro global trends, food security, health and well-being, and sustainability. We transform crops like corn, soybeans, and wheat into a complete portfolio of ingredients and flavors for foods and beverages, sustainable, renewable industrial products, dietary supplements, and nutrition for pets and livestock. We expand the, the entire food supply chain. I may start my day approving the purchase of new barges to help move crops and products up and down the Mississippi River and end it by talking about a new line of probiotics our researchers are developing. We are on the cutting edge of many of the major food trends you see in the headlines every day. For example, 
We work with our customers to bring together unique combinations of sustainable ingredients to make the great tasting plant-based meat burgers and more that are taking the industry by storm. It's truly an exciting and rewarding job. And consumers today are demanding foods that are natural, healthy, sustainable, and it's companies like ADM that are making those foods a reality. So as I reflected on what I wanted to discuss with you this evening, it was natural that I look back on my own life and career for the elements that have helped form my own path as a leader. But before I share those experiences, let me explain why my leadership philosophy is built on the concept of leading through learning. The first thing I think is important is that I believe leadership is at a premium today. We live in what has been characterized as a VUCA environment, an environment with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. In this context, employees are seeking leadership that helps them make sense of the changes around them. And the most effective leaders are ones who not only help people understand change, but also position them to anticipate, adapt, and thrive in an ever-evolving work environment. Leadership is about the future and helping your people and your organization to be ready for it. So let me give you an example of how things have changed even during my tenure as the ninth CEO of ADM. When I started, I focused my team on improving returns and we rallied around four priorities. And for simplicity, I call them the four C's, cash, cost, capital, and customers. And they sound very common sense for driving returns. As I look at where I spend my time today, four new C's have arrived and taken priority in my calendar. Culture, climate, cybersecurity, and consumers. Marking the significant changes technology and stakeholders are brought to businesses in the last decade. The second point I want to make uh, is that I believe the speed of learning is today our only true competitive advantage. With the astonishing amount of data being generated every second, knowledge is becoming obsolete faster every day. So actually knowing something is probably itself an obsolete concept. So that's why at ADM, leadership development and creating a learning organization are two of our top corporate priorities and my personal priorities. Of course, I attended many different leadership development courses over the years, read many, many leadership development books, and listen to my peers share their own perspectives on leadership. But after more than 30 years in business, I can say that I'm just work in progress. That's how I like to think about myself and my organization. So let me share with you today some of my own experiences to help bring to life, and hopefully we can learn together through the process. So let's talk about living through learning. So what do we need to learn? I think the first thing that I realized over all these years in my career is the first thing you need to learn is about yourself. That provides a critical foundation. Although conventional wisdom may tell us that leadership is all about what we're doing for others, but I believe that until you truly take on self-learning, self-reflection, you can't unlock your full potential as a leader. Two questions have been helpful for me in this quest. The first one is, what drives you? What drives you? I discovered over time that for me, the desire to learn and the desire to make a contribution are my primary drivers. And when I look back, I know they have marked every important decision I have made in my career. The second question, and a more difficult one, which, which I'm wrestling today, 
Am I the person I want to be right now? Am I the person I want to be right now? We all want to be somebody, but we all have an excuse for not to be that person right now. So self-awareness, but also the discipline to do something about it are both critical parts of setting aspirational goals throughout life. Over my career, uh, the leaders I admire the most have a clear emotional stamina that allows them to absorb sometimes the drama that get that goes across organizations and channel that into productive and purposeful act outcomes. Let me give you an example, or a recent example during COVID. As a company managing the global ag and food supply chain, ADM leaders need to be able to manage the regions of the world that were at different stages in dealing with the pandemic. Of course, everybody needed to eat in the world, and we have 800 facilities in 160 countries that we kept operating during the pandemic. But as you deal with each of those uh, geographies, they were all at different stages. The pandemic started in China, it progressed into Europe, then it started in uh, the US, then it get to South America, and then we went over and over into this. So they were all in widely different emotional stages. Some they were worrying with growing number of cases. At the same time, some were frustrated by vaccination logistics, and others were excited about managing the return to the workplace protocols, all happening at the same time. So these are vastly different situations and decisions that test a leader's resiliency and calm and the ability to provide that stability through all these up and downs. And then after that, Hurricane Ida hit. And through all this, we knew we needed to keep delivering food is essential, and we can't add another worry to people. Most of us take food for granted, and we would like it to continue being the case. Our IDM leaders, emotional stamina and resilience help us to get to the other side of the many events we have needed to manage to keep delivering on our purpose. The second thing that I think we need to learn is how to read the emotions of those around us. As a leader, we must think of ourselves as a multiplier for other leaders in our organization and consider deeply the impact we have in even a small engagements. This is a big responsibility. Think about how are people feeling after a meeting with you? To be a multiplier, you must consider leaving leaders better after our interactions. You should understand the impact of our words, the impact of our expectations at every point in time. My youngest memory of the impact of our expectation it's all the way from when I was eight years old, so it's 52 years ago. Education was very important in our family. And one night, my mom and, other, uh, and, and I were having dinner with my grandparents, and we were talking about how I did in school today. Again, education was important, so how did you do in school today? I said proudly that I got a nine in my math exam. So in Argentina, they rated from one to ten, so nine is a good thing. And while my grandparents parents were congratulating me and raving about how smart I was, my mother leaned over me and whispered, what happened? So I was like, certainly a strong woman. And, but I got the message. The message is, nobody knows me like she does, and she expects me to be a 10th student, because she knows I'm capable of that. 52 years ago, 52 years later, I'm still remembering to be a 10 type of person. So everybody needs a nudge sometimes. And as leaders, sometimes we think that setting expectations with our team is creating a contract for what they must accomplish to be considered successful. But I will challenge us to think differently, just as maybe my mother did at that time. She knew that setting an expectation could be more important, uh, importantly be a source of inspiration, an important way to motivate ongoing learning and growth. 
So again, setting expectations shouldn't be a limiting factor when done, when done correctly. It actually unlocks potential that we could never dream before. I do believe that if you give your employees a strong sense of direction, the context and the training, they will amaze you. So the role of the leader is not about people management, it's about inspiring colleagues to test how good they can be. And this is a big responsibility, but it's also a decision. Third, I think it is important that we also learn through others, have the humility to be open and to be able to learn from others. Let me share a story from several years ago that impacted my point of view on something in the industry. The story is breakfast with my daughter. So my daughter is like 26 today, but you know, this was several years ago. She left home a teenager and came home from college, a young woman. And one day she invited me for breakfast at her favorite place. And I discovered then how she has changed. So this was a small cafe where I noticed three things. First one, the place was packed with young people and a lot of baby strollers. Second, we had a huge board showing an area map with the name and locations of the farms where the eggs, the potatoes, the bread were coming from. And the third thing I noticed is that although the farms were located in close proximity, the prices in the menu made you think products were coming from a distant galaxy. So college students and young professionals were willing to pay this much for sustainable grown food. Something was changed. All of a sudden, all those marketing reports about the opportunity in traceable, sustainable nutrition came to life for me. Of course, one single conversation over breakfast doesn't always lead to transformational business outcomes. We should never overlook the importance that diverse perspectives have on how we lead or the decisions we make. At ADM, we try to remind that ourselves all the time we have a strong commitment to diversity equity and inclusion. And we believe that bringing together different backgrounds, perspectives and experiences drives innovative thinking, growth and diversity of thought. And that is a competitive advantage. Learning through others requires one of the most important leadership traits though, empathy. Of course, this is the ability not to simply listen to others, but to actually put yourself in their position and seek to learn where they are coming from and how they can best contribute to the goals of the organization. This form of learning isn't always comfortable, but is one of the most critical ways to build community and culture within a team of four or an organization of 40,000. Finally, I do believe we must learn to ask the right questions. With employees being bombarded by data and new sources of information, how do we make sense of all the data available to us? How do, how do we differentiate the important from the entertainment? How do we make a competitive advantage if data is everywhere and available to everybody? So spending time teaching our colleagues how to ask the right questions, learning about how we make decisions, Judging things not that much on the outcome, but on the process is what is critical. Sometimes we have to realize business is more like poker than chess. In chess, there are always one good move, one best move. But life and business sometimes is more like poker that you can make the wrong decisions and get lucky. And you can make the right decisions and sometimes things don't come out the right way. The important thing is to focus on, do you learn to your organization which is gonna make better decisions the next time, not just the outcome. We must focus on improving what we can control and that start with asking the right questions. As leaders, sometimes we are too quick to offer our opinion, too quick to tell, 
I'm still trying to fight that myself every day, trying to teach more by asking questions, guiding questions that lead the thought process of the team, not just lean too quickly into a solution. Not easy. Again, I'm working progress. So let me conclude by acknowledging the learning I receive and continue to receive from others. As I approach nearly a decade as CEO of this amazing company, I'm never more proud of the ADM leaders I have had the good fortune to call my colleagues. I'm grateful to each and every one of these ADM colleagues, as well as the bosses, teams, peers and friends over the span of my full career, who continue to inspire me to learn and every day. This award is for you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Juan. Uh, we do have a time for question and answers with the students. Um, and so let's have the first question. Bailey? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi, Juan. My name is Bailey McAbee. I am a second year Master of Human Resources student here at the Darla Moore School of Business. I just want to start by thanking you for being here and speaking with us tonight. You've spoken at length tonight on leadership, and I was just wondering if you could speak on some of the key similarities that you have seen between de developing internal leaders at ADM as well as external leaders as we prepare for our future careers. Yes, thank you. Um, I think somebody actually said it before in when we were having the, the Q&A with uh, some of the students. Uh, he was also a, a coach uh, in, in sports and he was talking about not just focusing on, on, on looking at the athletic abilities, but also looking at the whole person. And I think whether you're developing internal leaders or external leaders is more about Get into that, uh, get into the core of that person, get into for that person to know themselves, their principle, what they value, uh, and then help win, help them with the confidence to explore the leads. I mean, I notice in life, everybody's fully talented. Some people, uh, as you approach your level of comfort or your level of uncomfortable uh, positions, some people are has some people experience there are some encouragement and some coaching and some people that help to get them through that edge, if you will. And some, some people uh, find uh, somebody that actually undermine them or don't believe in them. And that creates a little bit their reaction to that edge. When you feel you're going to break through into something new, do you remember the, per the person that trusted you and encouraged you and believed in you? Or do you remember the person that belittled you or, 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 or didn't have that confidence? And I think that that's where we make the difference in people. So we need to be there. Person needs to put some of themselves, but we need to be there to give a little bit of that nudge, if you will, that we all need. Great, thank you. Next question. Alicia. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Alicia Grant, and I am also a Master of Human Resources student here. Um, and my question is for you, throughout the past decade, how have you seen leadership change, and what new skills have, been, have become essential for a leader to possess? Um, and in addition to that, how do you ensure that your team possesses these skills? Yeah, Alicia, very good question. Uh, I think we've seen, if you look at the, even at CEOs, um, we have seen humility and uh, the servant leader concept uh, approaching much more. I think that um, everybody realizes that the fantasy of having one person that can have Manage, that can manage all this complexity and be making all decisions is that it's a fantasy, it's a mirage. So people are much better suited uh, developing their teams. And as such, you cannot put yourself first. You can you have to put yourself last and, and being able to 
be available to those leaders. So I think that humility, I think empathy, as as I said, uh, uh, as I said before, things like culture and and uh, and and looking at uh, recognition and feedback have become much more important than being decisive and being strategic. Of course, every CEO needs a, a, a big a big part of being strategic, but. I think all that arrogance and decisiveness that, that, that or, or bravado that we've seen maybe before in that uh, uh, movie stars type of CEOs are, are not the kind of CEOs we have today. We have today people much more bedded into operations, much more people um, inside their teams and trying to help their teams grow. And I think that that, that, that has been a change of uh, the people I was looking up to when I was coming up to become a CEO maybe 15 years ago and the cadre of CEOs that you have today. And that's not a coincidence. I think shareholders are looking for that. I think boards are looking for that because that's what employees need and, and what companies need to success in the future, to have su successful futures. Yeah, humility and empathy, those great characteristics. Next question. Hi, my name is Melissa Pendleton, and I am a second year student in the MHR program. Has the global supply chain crisis affected ADM? And if yes, how do you plan to respond to it going forward? Yeah, so I, I, as I said before, I think that during the whole pandemic, we managed to keep all our work plans running or all our customers supplied. So I think that, um, to us directly, it didn't. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we have to scramble a little bit because there is a raw material missing here. I think the biggest issue today is uh, is the labor shortages that we found. Um, I think the reason for this is is relatively simple. COVID had an uh, uneven impact in demand and supply, while COVID uh, increased the demand for goods. Think about it, all your budget for services, whether your services were going to the gym or going to the movies or traveling or dining out, all that budget was you know, impossible to spend because of the pandemic, but then you transfer all that into spending in goods. So goods over services, but also the increase in online purchases, you could continue to spend and you could spend more because you were at home. So for most businesses, demand, demand did not suffer that much for goods unless you were running a cruise line. But demand for goods didn't suffer that much. On the other side, on the supply side, you see the issues of lockdowns, and but also people rethinking how they want to live their lives. And in the US, 4.3 million workers are not in the workforce anymore that were before the pandemic. So that has creating complications in transportation. There are really no truck drivers these days, creating complications in being able to add an extra shift. And that has created inflation because the reality is that uh, people having more demand without able to supply that demand because either they cannot get uh, the, the workers to put an extra shift or they cannot pay for the steel uh, to build the next plant, people are resorting to increasing prices. So I, I think that's a reason today. I think that part of that will last uh, probably through uh, the big part of 2022 before we get out of this. All right, thank you. Next question. Hello, I'm Melissa Willoughby, a Master's of Human Resources student here at USC. Um, and my question is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being the ninth CEO for a company that's been operating for over a century? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's always useful and humbling to look at the history of the company. And um, so if you think about ADM has been around for 120 years, and you think that you're going to be, let's say that you're going to be around for 10 years, and then you realize the just measure of your impact, you know, it, should, it doesn't get to your head. You know, the company has was very successful before you, and it's going to be very successful, hopefully, after you. So, so I think it gives you a sense of perspective. Um, on the other hand, 
as you think about you know your tenure as a CEO, uh, most of the time you leverage what your previous your predecessor did, and, and, and you can enhance it. But you work a lot into the optionality you're leaving for the next person. To a certain degree, the CEO role from a financial perspective manages this uh, dichotomy or, or ambidexterity needed to deliver on commitments, and you need to deliver those commitments every quarter, but also on working on uh, providing optionality, if you will, possibilities for the future. It's very difficult to, to know exactly what ADM or where the world is going to be in 50 years. But I need to be able to build optionality so the next leader can be able to pivot ADM or work and make sure ADM is still relevant if scenarios change. So to a certain degree, you, 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 you live in all those uh, two realities. So um, I think the other thing that you think when you look at the perspective of you're going to have 10 years to influence all this is you think about your legacy. And that's what I focus so much on people. Listen, nobody will remember 10 years down the road whether we make, you know, a dollar per share in the third quarter of 2021. Your only true legacy is the leaders you leave behind, is the character of the company that you leave and the leaders that that is going to lead that company after you. And even as I look back on my history in Dow Chemical and all that, I don't remember the financial results. I remember the people that still count with my advice even today as they don't report anymore to me. Like once in my team, like you're always in my team. And I think that's the best legacy you can get. But that, that couldn't be a better sales pitch for the Leadership Legacy Award, could it? Uh, next question. Thank you for speaking with us today, Mr. Luciano. My name is Tamora Jabwin, a second year MHR student. And my thought for you is, I've read that you have increased usage of innovative technologies to meet customers' needs and led a strategic growth campaign that expanded ADM's global footprint. My question to you is, what actions or practices have been taken on to display this end result? And are what holistic approaches are the company practicing to assure they are building a healthy culture for tomorrow? Yeah, thank you. The technology we're using is a lot in, in uh, uh, consumer insights. And, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest decision that, that the CEO makes is basically where to play. So you're constantly seeking uh, the, 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 the future to see uh, where should they invest the capital. But, you know, companies that have heavy capital, I need to build a plant that may cost a billion dollars. So you need to work it or amortize it over the next 50 years. So the trends need to be very uh, strong and durable for us to be able to recover that. That's why we select food security and health and well-being and sustainability. You might argue sometimes we get too soon to some of the trends, but it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, let me give you an example. ADM launched the veggie burger, the first plant-based burger, in 1982. We were a little bit ahead of our time, so we were like 40 years ahead of people who were ready to do that, or the technology could make it, you know, uh, flavorful, if you will. Um, so we do a lot of uh, anal uh, analytics and artificial intelligence and, and in terms of customer survey or consumer surveys and all that. And, and I think that that has been a complement to people and has been an accelerator because it helps you to bring better insights so you can use um, your talent in a better way more than crunching data in actually providing insights and providing knowledge. And that has been uh, very well accepted and percolated through the company. Um, so, uh, so I think that uh, the end result of that is this continued uh, openness in the culture 
I don't like anymore. You know, when I joined ABM, people will introduce myself and I said, and they said, I'm so and so. I've been with ADM for 30 years. We have tried to eradicate that. What does it mean that you've been with ADM with 30 years? Because if your knowledge is 30 years old and you didn't learn anything in the last 29 years, your knowledge doesn't serve you anymore. So you can have one year of knowledge, 30 years old and repeat it 30 times, or you can have 30 years of knowledge where you have learned during seven or eight different experiences. So what we have tried to create is that culture of openness, of curiosity, and not just considering that our knowledge is our equity. Our equity is much more what we can do to others, what we, how can we make sense of data, and you know, can we make decisions based on the realities of today, not the realities of 30 years ago. Okay, yeah. another question. Good evening, my name is Hayden Rothschild and I'm a second year student in the MHR program. I read, no. that, I read that ADM recently implemented new organizational structures and business processes, such as enhanced centers of excellence and a transformation project. These are intended to drive better decision-making and operational excellence, but what have been the challenges of implementation? Has there been any resistance across the business? Oh, of course. <laughs> Everything worth doing uh, receives a lot of resistance. Listen, uh, you have to think about that. Uh, management in a company is put together with only one function, to preserve status quo. Management role is to continue to produce this exactly the same way. So when you as a leader want to do something different, you are going against their DNA. DNA of management is to preserve the status quo. So there's always that tension. So every time you're going to do something in a company, you need to think about how you're going to sell it, how you're going to, how you're going to demonstrate it, how you're going to engage leaders in the company to help you move this forward. So the, the COE's discussion is, is simple. I mean, we are a very large company that have three main businesses and where there are a lot of things that are done repeatedly in those businesses. And I don't want to develop some base thing three times. And I always said, if ADM knew what ADM knows, in a, in a large company, the ability to transfer knowledge horizontally is critical. And there is always a problem in ADM in one place that is tried to be resolved that has been resolved in another play, only that people don't know about it. So centers of excellence, sometimes what they do when they are done properly is that they concentrate that knowledge. So if somebody needs to uh, build a dryer, that we don't need to go and research the dryer. We have a person that knows which is the best dryer to use in ADM, period. So you go to that center and you get the dryer. So you don't need to think about it. It happens to me early on in my career. I went to Brazil and in Brazil we're thinking about how to down gauge the packaging of one of our oils, bottle oils that we sell to um, in supermarkets. Well, I, I was just in India whether they have developed a new uh, shape of bottle that allows them to reduce 20%. So the Brazilian team had no idea what the Indian team had done. And, you know, probably if I would have not visited both of them, they would never meet each other. They would never know that there was a solution without, within ADM. So you always think about if ADM knew what ADM knows and you try to create vehicles, excuses for that knowledge to be, uh, to be shared, to be to be available for everybody so we don't have to duplicate the knowledge. So I always like to say to ADMers, I don't mind having a problem. I want to be resolving new problems. I hate to be solving old problems, problems that other ADMers have resolved before. So the COEs or Center of Excellence are just another excuse, organizational device, if you will, to try to get that uh, knowledge to be shared horizontally. 
So we, uh, as, as you can tell, we have a number of master's students that are here, but I also am really impressed at the number of undergraduates, and I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to ask a final question in honor of uh, these young students, and that is one of my favorite songs from one of my favorite groups is titled Dear Younger Me, uh, and it's about somebody who's writing to their younger selves. As you look at this generation of talent coming up, and in light of your own career, what advice would you give to the dear younger me's that are out in the audience today? Yeah, you know, I, I have a couple of uh, younger youths in my family. So my son is uh, 30, my, my daughter is 26. And uh, I have so much hope because all of you are so much better than 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 I was at, at my age. Um, so part of my advice will be don't listen that much to us. You know, we get us to some of these and, and, and we have a lot of things that we need to improve. We need to improve, uh, you know, equality and, and, and the way we treat each other. We need to improve the planet. We need to improve many things. So we got you here. So don't listen that much to us. The second thing is also uh, cut yourself some slack. When I hear the young people, the responsibilities are so overwhelming. When I was your age, I just wanted to get the job, make some money so I can marry my girlfriend. Um, and now I hear young people and it's like, I need to save the world. I need to fight hunger in Africa. I need to, you know, solve the problem of packaging in the ocean. And yes, those are all good ideas, but also sometimes they become overwhelming at the time that you are trying to discover yourself. You have so many years in front of you. I've been working for 37 years and I still haven't retired. So you're gonna have an opportunity to do your thing many, many times. Don't get too you know, concerned about, you need to know who you are tomorrow. You need to know what's your crusade tomorrow morning. Give yourself some time. You are already from a starting point so much better than what our generation was. So we're in very good hands. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Juan. And I, I can say that uh, my son is taking your advice about don't listen to us. Um, he's informed me uh, multiple times that I'm old and I don't know what the world's like today. So anyway, Juan, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, round of applause for Juan. Thank you. It in closing, let me thank a few people. Um, first of all, let me thank the MHR students. We appreciate you being here. We thank the undergrads and all the, the other students here. Um, no, it's not always the funnest time to be sitting in a classroom. We appreciate you coming. Thank you to my colleagues for uh, coming today. Thanks to Pete, uh, mm -hmm. Dean Bruce, for being willing to spend time out of his busy day doing the introduction. And of course, thanks to Corey Jones, who put all of this together and ran it all. Special kudos. Juan, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We look forward to uh, seeing you here in person one of these days. Thanks and have a great My day. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.